Good morning, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves last night at our, at our dinner, and uh, thank you very much for your comments this morning to the, uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, what I'd like to do is to kick off things here with a fairly big picture overview of some of the larger problems that we're thinking about or confronting. So we're all aware that there's massive changes in the Earth's ecosystems. It's not just coral reefs. A lot of systems are under threat or under pressure of different sorts. We know that climate change is killing corals, but there's also, it's also having a lot of other impacts on other systems across the globe. <clears throat> and we ask ourselves, still, does society care about this? Why, why aren't we doing stuff about it? And if you talk to anybody on the street, yes, they care intensely. So how did it get this bad, and, and why aren't we fixing the problem? Since we're clearly rational beings, we've got the capacity to act, to, to, to change what we do. So why isn't society doing more about this? And it, if you think about it uh, at a personal level, it, it starts to feel a bit like you're trapped. You're caught up in a situation where you would like things to be different, you want to change the system, but you don't know how. And this is one of those things that science should, in theory, be thinking about and addressing, but it hasn't really been on our radar because a lot of our experience is quite subjective, and scientists often are a bit nervous of stuff that seems quite subjective. So we have some uh, ideas or guidelines about where things are going or what the problems are. There's this paper on planetary boundaries that's been highly uh, cited, highly uh, influential in the global community. This, uh, this graphic here shows you the Earth at the center, and it suggests that we're, we've got a set of limits, that if we want to live a sustainable life, if we want to keep the Earth's systems functioning, we need to remain within those limits. And we're at risk of exceeding them in things like, for example, biogeochemical flows, and also the integrity of the biosphere, the loss of genetic diversity. These figures on the right illustrate the same idea from a slightly different perspective, particularly this one here. If we think about climate change and some kind of local stressor, there's a safe operating space here, and once you move outside that space, you're starting to run into, into danger, into problem of some sort. What a picture like this doesn't tell you, or what this perspective doesn't tell you, is how we got there, or what we should do about it. Right? It's, it, it's fairly simple to say, well, we need to think about the Earth's nitrogen budget and use a bit less nitrogen, but why are we using so much nitrogen? And what would we actually need to do if we want to reduce nitrogen inputs to, to ecosystems? If we wanted to get rid of the dead zone at the end of the Mississippi River, for example, what, what would we actually need to do about this? So this framework suggests that there's a problem, but it doesn't tell us what to do about the problem. If you ask many ecologists, how did we get here, they'll say, well, it's the fault of development. It's economic growth that's, that's got us here. So if we think about development, development ideas or models of development have followed a series of stages over the years. This is one of the early ideas about development. It was, it was partly posed as a, a response to the ideas of Karl Marx and the rise of communism. So you've got to interpret it from a historical perspective. Rostov proposed that you might have a society which is a fairly traditional society where people depend heavily on ecosystems. In that society, economic growth starts to occur. You get some set of preconditions forming. Then you get what he, he termed takeoff, a rapid uh, change in the economic status of the community and a change in their relationship to natural resources. Although natural resources have been a bit of a, a casualty in this whole story because people haven't thought about them very carefully. This has le then led to a, what he termed a drive to maturity and ultimately into a stage of high mass consumption. So Rostov regarded this as a typical developmental trajectory. During this process, he thought, well, population size, you get a demographic transition, which you can see in many countries today. So you end up with lower growth rates, smaller, richer families. People don't have to invest so much in, in having children because they're more <coughs> secure financially into their old age and they don't need kids to provide for them. He noted that the continued Growth and development in this context depends on immigration from the periphery, so those areas that are not in this high mass consumption stage. Something else important to note about this model is that if you have someone who's depending directly on natural resources, they're harvesting resources on a daily basis, they're familiar with what's happening. If you're going out with a, a fish trap and catching fish, you're going to notice immediately if the fish stock starts to decline. By the time you get up to this end of this continuum, 
your fish is barely recognizable on your plate. You might not even know you're eating fish sometimes, and you certainly don't know which end of the fish it is, and you've got no idea what's happening to the fish stock that it's drawn from. So there's a, a link between people and nature that's much tighter down here, and that gets reduced in strength as you start to move up this continuum. <clears throat> now, post-Rostov, uh, the economist Simon Kuznets proposed this model, which has also been quite uh, widely considered and, and, and influential. So he suggested that as societies get wealthier, which is this axis down here, we get a shift in the level of pollution. So a society with relatively few people living in some kind of supposed balance with nature, uh, as the population grows and people get wealthier, that he proposed that there's a turning point of income. So you industrialize, essentially, and then you start to care about your environment after that. Once you're wealthy, you've got the luxury of developing environmental protections of different sorts. And he suggested that pollution levels should then decline. So the, the people who've bought into this theory say, well, it's not really a problem what's going on. Things have got to get worse before they get better. Once everybody's rich and wealthy, um, population growth will be low and there'll be a good life for everybody. And a good example of this uh, Kuznets curve in action comes from sulfur emissions. So people were able to successfully solve the problem of acid rain in Europe, and you now see much lower sulfur in, in rainfall generally. Now, this is a complex figure and I'd like to talk you through it a bit. This is an alternative um, way of thinking about the problem. One, one of the things that's bothered me for a long time about the economic perspectives is that they often regard ecosystems as limitless, and the idea that you can just keep harvesting these resources because they grow again, and, uh, and therefore there's no real issue. So this presents an alternative perspective. This is, a, if you like, a third alternative model to explain the same things we're seeing. This axis here suggests ecological degradation, and here household wealth. So if we start again at Rostov's starting point of a, a loop in which um, people are dependent quite closely on natural resources, they have a tight relationship with nature, they get feedbacks from the resources they're harvesting that allow them then to modify the, the harvesting strategy they're using. So a typical rural community, what happens as this population grows is that the resources that are there are not adequate to support the community anymore. Human communities quite quickly get too large to be supported by local resources. So they then have to make a decision, essentially, one option is to keep carving up available resources into smaller and smaller parcels and, and to keep spreading across the landscape. That can easily lead you into what I think of as a green trap. You see this a lot in North Africa, countries like Mali or Niger, where societies that are heavily dependent on agriculture remain dependent on ag agriculture, but as the population grows, um, the amount of available land and the quality of available land becomes much less. And this can lead you to collapse and famine, as we've seen in countries like Ethiopia. Alternatively, a society could industrialize, so you concentrate people in cities, you uh, maintain a group of farmers who provide food for those people, and instead the economy develops um, through things like service, industry, manufacturing. <clears throat> that can lead, uh, as we know, to an increase in the quality of life for many people, but it can also lead you into a trap of its own sort. So. The red, what I think of as the red trap, it's described in this paper here that we, we did in Nature in 2015. The red trap or urban greed suggests that people overconsume and they can't or will not change in response to ecological declines. And many of us are probably unwittingly living in this situation now where the amount of resources that we use is well beyond what the earth can support if everyone were to have a lifestyle like us. But it's essentially being subsidized by the people who live down in the green trap who have a much lower quality of life in many cases. So this whole set of dynamics is driven by population growth and remote resource acquisition. But what happens when you start getting up here is that very few people are directly connected to the ecosystems that their food comes from. You might go down to the shops here and buy some green beans that were grown in Zambia, and you've got no idea whether your action in harvesting those beans effectively or providing a market for those beans has an impact on resource in Zambia because it's really far away from you and really different. So the focus, as people get more and more focused on commodities, goods, telephones, computers, they start thinking less and less about ecosystems. And there's a focus on non-ecosystem goods and services that weakens those feedbacks. So what I've done now is offer you three different perspectives on economic growth and development. What I'd like to do then is to confront these with a little bit of data. 
And I'd ask people please not to, not to tweet any of these following slides because they're from a paper that's in a, a second stage of review at PNAS. Um, so hopefully, hopefully this will be out in the peer-reviewed literature fairly soon. So in the figures I'm going to show you, that you'll see a lot of little black dots like this. Uh, each of those dots represents an individual country. So these are national level data that I'm dealing with. I'm also going to talk about the Human Development Index, or HDI. This is an index based partly on, on, on economic indicators, um, but it's essentially a measure of human well-being. Economic well-being, right? There's a lot of other kinds of well-being that it doesn't capture or measure. So the first thing is that the data are bimodal when you look at them. The Human Development Index data are bimodal, and it's fitted by these. This is the best fitting model for these particular data. So we've actually got two different groups of people in the world living at different, um, different levels of well-being. And if we separate out the, the people in class HD, HDI1, which is over on this side of the histogram here, you can see that as the population grows, per capita GDP goes up. So in these countries, when you have more people, it converts into economic growth. More people equals more money in a wealthier society. By contrast, on the other end of the scale down here, termed HDI4, when you have more people um, entering the population, it leads to a reduction in per capita GDP. So more people actually equals increasing poverty as opposed to increasing wealth. So there's a fundamentally different dynamic occurring between these two peaks of this graph. If we try and relate this back to natural resources, you can see that population reliance on natural resources is higher in less wealthy nations. So this is GDP now on the x-axis here. The value added to GDP by agriculture or by forestry, respectively. And you can see over on this side, the wealthy countries really depend very little on agriculture for their wealth, whereas the, the less wealthy countries, often agriculture is a, a dominant feature of their economy. And the, and the same for forestry and fisheries, a whole lot of other kinds of natural resource. The data also, surprisingly though, say that, well, perhaps not surprisingly, but um, <clears throat> say that wealthier countries consume more natural resources. So this axis here shows you the ecological footprint. That's an estimate of the overall use of resources of all these different countries here. And this shows you the development index. And as you move up, get, become wealthier and wealthier, you see that the ecological footprint increases. So wealthy countries consume more. And you might look at a place like Luxembourg over here and say, oh, that's really green. They're really ecologically friendly. They do their recycling. They must be leading a, an, an ecologically friendly life. Wouldn't it be great if everybody lived like that? Luxembourg f sits up here. They get most of their resources from other countries. So they can afford to look like that locally because you don't see the impacts of what they're doing here in Luxembourg. You see them in other countries like Zambia or Mali or other places, right? So another part of the problem is what happens with population growth. So as the Human Development Index increases, population growth declines, and this fits with what Rostov and others have argued that as societies get wealthier, your population growth rate declines. You see here that uh, as per capita GDP goes up, you get this initial rapid increase in human well-being, and then it starts to level off. So being rich doesn't make, you, doesn't make you better off beyond a certain point. There's a level at which this evens out. All right, so what we need to do is to pull together these different strands of evidence. I, I won't go into detail on this slide. Uh, just to show you that there are some uh, fairly simple equations underlying this. This particular equation here you can solve as, as an autonomous differential equation. And again, I'm not going to go into any detail on this. But what it shows, to cut to the chase, is that if you include a fair bit of variance in the parameters, the result is consistent. So the evidence, there's strong evidence for two alternate stable states in national economies across the globe. So we don't have a steady linear increase, as Rostov suggested, and we don't have a, a hump-shaped curve like Kuznet suggested. Instead, what we've got is a, is a global economy where countries fall into one of these two attractors, which roughly equate to the poorer nations of the world and the wealthier nations of the world. And it's possible to move between these. So countries like Chile, for example, has been able to move from, I think, an HDI value of three up to one. And it's done that through mineral exploitation, right? So through, through copper and wise use of the resources generated from, from copper. But what's key to note here is that although this is the desired uh, endpoint for many management agencies, many aid agencies, it doesn't help the environment. If we think about the environment, countries moving into this spot of this curve are actually doing worse things for the environment than the, than the ones that are poorer. 
All right, so what are the, just to wrap up, what are the implications for, for coral reefs? Many nations with coral reefs are developing and developing fast. That development's only going to increase pressure on the reefs and getting richer is going to shift that pressure from the local environment to the global environment. So is there some kind of solution? How do we, how do we resolve this? And I think one of the key things is we need a different model for development. It needs to be equitable, just... We need sustainable solutions, obviously, but I think we're going to have to see some kind of value change. We need lower consumption, we need to think more about renewable energy, and we need to value the environment over wealth. In addition, obviously, more food is, is equating to more people. So there's this debate going on in developing nations, is food security a cause or a consequence of, uh, of population growth? When we think about traditional tenure models, as I'm sure we'll hear about later in the, in the meeting, can these survive population increase? What, what's the role of traditional systems? Because obviously there's potentially important um, links there that, that can govern how people relate to nature. And this, this uh, I think all of this sets in place a strong need for at the science practice interface for us to develop and to demonstrate genuine alternatives. Are there other ways we can do things? Can we transform the way that people are managing and responding to environmental change in a way that leads it to be more sustainable. Because at the moment, the data show clearly it's not sustainable. We can't all have a first world lifestyle. So is it possible then to cultivate local social ecological resilience in the face of these global pressures? And with that, I'd like to end off. I'd like to thank my co-author, Stefan von Cromon, who's worked with me on the, on the economics of this. And thank you. <laughs>